Thank you, Al. <laughs> Delighted to be here. This is rich stuff. Rich for you personally, your family, your community, everyone you come in contact with, and people you won't even remember that will come back to you because of the way in which you go about your journey. Rich, rich, rich. I am going to attempt to read it up here. So I was asked foresight in the company, foresight in Wisconsin. So that's what I'm going to attempt to cover in 15 minutes. Early 20s, 20 years old, out of school, industrial engineer. Got started with my learning and development, probably in Boy Scouts, without a doubt, 11 years old. And maybe before that, five years old. But that's in The Power to Serve, the book. How many people have seen The Power to Serve book? Oh, that's pretty interesting. It's available. Uh, as the receptionist, normally they get you the book. Uh, powerful. It's 50 years of the culture journey. Um, in my 20s, they put the I system through, and lots of Wheeler dealers were involved in that Eisenhower era, and he wanted to connect up the country in fast-paced industrial, and it was really, part of it was military. Um, and there was a bunch of Wheeler dealers was going across the country. Uh, the system of fair and equitable treatment was not the norm. There was Wheeler and dealers along the way. Oh, I'm going to make some money. You know that. You've heard them. They're around today. Lots of them. Storm comes into place. Hurricane. People are down there taking advantage of people. Um, it tries, they try to regulate it, and they do. Still somebody figures it out. The community, family, business, and faith, and spirituality are all connected. But at the time, people said, how can you, spirituality is spirituality, community is community, uh, business is business, they don't connect. And in my own mind, I said, now I'm a kid coming out of school, I said, they must be schizophrenic. They are absolutely connected. You cannot disconnect all those. What goes on at home goes out in business, what goes on in your work affects the home, both. So uh, I began with the Noble Experiment, later dubbed the Noble Experiment. I didn't say anything, buddy. I just used my own example. And I pointed the way. Now at the time, the first 15 years of the business, the industry was in antitrust. Anybody know what that means? No. It's man, one guy does. Okay. <clears throat> what it means is people get together and say, this is my customer. Uh, here's a bid. You give it to him. I'll give it to your customer. Public bids, it's against the law. In fact, the repercussions of doing this is um, a felony. You lose your citizenship, you go to jail, very serious. Even after you've turned a bid in, you discuss it with somebody. That, and you have a pattern of that, that's antitrust. So 15 years, I'm, I'm a really naive guy. I'm sitting here, and I'm still naive. It's just, just the way I operate. I trust people unless they goof it up. And goofing up and making a mistake is one thing. Manipulation is something quite different. Our society was not built on that. Our lives, the rich part, are not built on that. So uh, I just said, well, we're just going to, I'm going to use my faith journey quietly and I'll just go do this stuff. Now, some things that we did, <clears throat> I believe in PMRs, post meeting reactions. People drove, were driven crazy with this. But it's about listening to understand what is needed. So at the end of this program, normally, do you have PMRs here? We have um, not done them in the last couple, but we have had them. OK, I would appreciate it. When they're done, yeah. send them a PNR. We do it now electronically. It all gathers together very quickly and easily. But it tells you what you enjoyed, what was meaningful, and you make recommendations. And that just keeps feeding on itself, feeding on itself. You get better and better and better. It gets pretty fine points, but you're always responding, and you give the person that gives it to you, that group, we're going to do this and this at the next meeting, or the next thing we do. <clears throat> Continuing education on your own time, uh, but we take care of the expenses. Uh, we could not possibly, in that environment of everybody being antitrust, 
Uh, I'll give you an example of antitrust. The president of AT&T in Wisconsin, when he retired, said, Dick, I'd appreciate talking to you. I want to tell you something. When you first came on the scene, they said, that's not fair bidding. That guy doesn't know what he's doing. Then later on, they said, uh, sorry, if he's bidding, we're not going to bid. And they knew that he had to get three bids, and he couldn't get three bids. So he said, I was just stuck, and I just want you to know it. I want you to know it. And I'm, I, I'm honored to be able to talk to you, and I'm delighted that you're doing as well as you're doing. But 15 years later, a guy calls me up on the phone, and he says, congratulations, Dick, Saturday morning. I said, for what? He said, well, there's a headline, antitrust, all these people are under indictment by the federal government. And then, oh, that's interesting. And then, of course, the FBI comes in your place, records, buy the truckload we're going out. Because we bid on some work, we probably save some people from going to jail. They were convicted, the big guys, and then the state took the evidence that the federals didn't use, and they gave it to the state, and then the state came after them again. Except the state had a, little, had a more fair approach. So I asked my attorney, are they looking the letter of the law or are they just looking for people that are really predators? He says, no, they're looking for predators. So I gave him all the information we had. The FBI was something else. I mean, they were they're, they're like the bad guys in the good world. <laughs> um, anyways, so that passed. But it's still everybody got convicted. It happened, happened. Um, but our business was a little bit easier. Now, along the way, um, we had continuing education on your own time. Industry, the industry said, you can't do that. And I said, well, it's up to them. We're going to give them something they didn't have. They can go any place they want and work, and it'll build their skills up. And the story was, in 20 years, 80% of what you know will be outdated. So we've got to continually learn. And we're going to give you more that you can do yourself if, as opposed to this administration. And so that's what we did. And whatever they wanted to do, that's what we taught. And management would say, we want to teach them this, teach them that, okay. First class meals in the evening, uh, hour and a half long. Uh, and what they liked was the camaraderie and the discussion among the groups, these round tables, square. <laughs> um, and so that's what we did. And it was, classes were loaded uh, continuously. Well, we started with a pilot. The pilot was one department. We set a goal five years out. And in one year, they blew the five-year goal away. Then we set a little bit higher goal, how many hours a year, and at a certain quality level. And they blew that away. So then we went to a whole branch. Then we went to a whole company. And the industry said, you can't possibly do that. But we were doing it. And then the union wanted to know how, and we tried to teach them how, but they didn't quite get it. Uh, but we were known across the country for this continuing education. That's a long time ago. Uh, sales, we had a sales force. Three guys got a sales manager, a sales guy. We went down to Janesville. That was our first branch. And we, uh, they covered Janesville and Beloit in two weeks. We couldn't possibly handle the business they generated. So we had to lay some salespeople off. And then eventually we had that problem continuously, but we listened to the customer. We did surveys of the customer. We did surveys of the employees. And we listened, and they told us what the answers were. And then that's what we implemented. So um, we eventually had to lay the sales force off, and we just drove it with value. Give value to the customer, listen to them closely, what can we do for them that might help them? And the whole idea of that is our job is to lower, make them more effective, lower their costs so that people have more to purchase. And who in the world gets the best value? Who is the biggest effect? Anybody know? Give a guess. Who is benefited the most? Pardon me? What section of society? The trades. Pardon me? The trades, okay, thank you. Any other guesses? This side of the room, you got thinking people here, come on. Go ahead, what do you think? Give a guess, there's no right and wrong answers here, but I will give you what, what it really happens. Middle class? Pardon me? Middle class? Middle class? You're getting closer, you're getting closer. 
the least privileged in our society. They spend every nickel on food and housing, and they're always short of money. When things really get tough, they go from hamburger to beans, and then beans to rice, and from milk to Kool-Aid. They are the ones that benefit the most because they spend every, they don't, every penny they get, whether they're on welfare or they're, they're working. And so they benefit if we can lower the costs of education, taxes, buildings, because they pay rent. Um, so that's value added. Later on, we had uh, WANG, which is Waste Elimination Networking Group. Uh, Forty percent, any idea, and this was done from the field up, they decided how to gather the information. And we agreed that 40% um, was the goal. Anything that was 40% or more reduction in hours, and most of them are, some are 70% reduction in hours. And there's 150 applications like that. They kind of stopped that a few years ago. But, you know, they say they have a, a shortage of qualified people. Actually, they've always had that. Uh, quality people have always been short. But if you could reduce all the hours in the industry by 40%, would we be okay with the number of people we need? And how would that affect this whole society? And what kind of a pace setter would you be? And we always wanted to be a pace setter, add value, we'll share our information. So 37% of the hours that the customer actually pays for that gets something done is how effective the industry, the whole construction industry. Now there's some things like getting material to the site, um, certain things that you gotta do that the customer doesn't pay for, but they pay for installing the light, putting the mic up there, that's what they pay for. And only 37% of the time they do that. So there's a lot of wasted time. And it's not as much fun when you waste it and when you are more productive. We had a, a guy I worked with when I was a teenager, Leonard Zahn was his name, one of the big three. There was three electricians in the company. And uh, you never moved that you didn't do something. You went, went to the house, you took some material and tools. You came back to the truck, you took some that you weren't using now. Whatever move you made, I remember years ago, we were working for Marcus in an office building, and the guy calls me up first thing in the morning. He says, Dick, this guy does not know what he's doing. He hardly moves. Then he called me back two hours later. He says, I take it all back. I can't believe how much he gets done. That was Leonard Zahn. Quiet, every move count. Big, huge hands, first class guy. Um, so that's this. Open shop, we said, well, it looks like merit shop is coming along. The unions aren't keeping up with things. When it gets to the 50% level, we will have an open shop someplace in the country that's appropriate. And that's what we did. And at one point, open shop was making the money for the North. Another point, the North was taking care of a huge job we had in the South that was a disaster, but it was union. Uh, management formation. People on the job has to have the information they need. How is the job doing? And so we had something called homostatic control. I'll tell you that later. Uh, information system, we had a query system. First we had a NCR machine, then a query system. Then we went to database, which is a complete rebuild of the, everything. Um, but, and it was in, in construction, jobbing, line, and manufacturing. They are all different, different businesses different set of skills, different overheads, etc. cetera. Um, interviewing electricians. You can't interview electricians. Well, we want to put the right guy in the right job. You can't do that. We did it anyways, and it was not a problem. It was logical. The industry and the union objected, but we just did it, and we did it for the right reasons. So going back to the list here, uh, 30s, I, I really had trouble getting the right people. Uh, so the first thing I did every morning was that's what I was doing, looking for people who could be promoted two levels above was what I said, not just for the job, two levels above. Uh, needed management, they needed management information. The, we got really high quality people out of high schools. So they were top 20% of their math and we were treating them like robots. So when we started learning, now they're very, meticulous and precise, so a step at a time. 
but they grabbed and ran with that stuff. And the people that did the teaching, whoever was the best in that area became the teacher. We learned that from the merit shop people. They called it the ABCs. Um, then I painted a picture uh, through a video in my late 40s of, of this whole waste elimination, noble experiment, the board dubbed that that, and what we're doing to be able to have a broader spectrum. Um, the 50s, what do we do with this business? It was quite big then. And uh, we went through a process. First phase didn't work. Second phase was, second time we looked at it, we said, we'll just sell it to the employees. And so that's what we did. It was a $110 million gift to the employees at the time. Written offer to buy the company for that. But no, I'm going to give it to the employees. But they have to sell the same way they bought the stock for. They can't liquidate. They can't merge. They can't change the way in which stock is bought and sold without the permission of the D1 stock, which is in the SRP per Family Foundation, which is controlled by outsiders and approved by the IRS over a five-year period. Uh, and that's a very interesting story unto itself. Um, the 60s, we implemented the employee ownership and the Noble Experiment, a more explicit. So, um, Foresight, Peeper Electric, in, in the servant leader mode, in 2008, nobody in the state of Wisconsin used the word servant leadership. So we had a series of three meetings with governors, mayors, uh, just, you could come, it was down at the Milwaukee Athletic Club, three meetings for in the morning, breakfast. And the mayor always showed up, and it's surprising who showed up. Everybody was invited. They all signed a statement inviting uh, the Greenleaf Center to Wisconsin to have this international conference. At that conference, uh, it was very, uh, very popular with deans of engineering school. Was, a guy sat in the back, he just sat there and analyzed and analyzed. Very interesting people came. And they, what they said was, I didn't know there were other people like that, and I want to meet more of them. Heart and head connected. Lifting others' capacity. Respecting. Empathizing. Who would you want? What do you want your kids to do? What do you want your grandchildren to do? Friends, neighbors. Is that a nice way to do it, or what would happen? Well, each one of you individually have a great broad influence in your lifetime. And if you just go with that approach, don't expect anything in return. Don't run around telling other people how they ought to do things. Just demonstrate it. When they say, why do you do it? Well, here you can have this servant leader card or this piece of paper you just got. This is how it works. Well, how, what, what, how do I, I don't know about this. Well, you go to a website. There's over 200 examples, videos of people in Wisconsin. And this young man, Sean, has shot most of them. But there was two people before him, all this first class folks from UW video department. Um, all examples, six, eight minutes. Example, example, example. Um, so uh, after that, uh, we started, we had a meeting. We called it a citywide meeting now. But it was just a meeting. Everybody comes together. We talked. What do you want to do going forward? Anything we do, if you come up with the idea, we'll support you, but you've got to do it, lead it, because this is an all-volunteer operation. It's got to be for the right reasons, the right value. It's got to be attractive to you. You've got to be more turned on with this than with your work, or you can integrate the two. And so that's what we did. And there were several ideas. One of them was the round tables, which is the most popular thing. Um, so in 2010, we started that. A small group gathered together. They're now exaggerating how many people came together. But there was a guy named Tom Thibodeau, who I'd never met, and myself, that kind of coalesced. He's quite different than I am. I'm an organization person. He's a, a spokesman and a motivator and very literate. And he has a master's program in servant leadership in the Turbo. And they have a PhD program in ethics that complements servant leadership. Uh, we have somebody here uh, in Peeper that's getting their PhD in ethics, which includes, and this, they're doing a story on Peeper, is their 
master's or their dissertation is going to be on paper um, and capture that. So um, in 2020, we said we're going to have another one. We've got to boost up the state and we want to boost up the international. And so 2020 was COVID. We waited, said this is, never, this is not going to get over to the next year. So 2021, we went virtual. There were 11, 111 resources, 28 programs and sessions, large sessions, 18 or more people in a session. After the speaker, they would break out into small groups, just like you do here. And they would then feed back all virtually to the large group. And then we discovered some people don't want to be in small groups. Oh, so we just let them in the big room. And we, had a, had, we actually had a session there like we, the other guys were having, but they felt more comfortable staying where they were. Uh, highly successful. And from that, we had 30 people that the various volunteers identified that they thought were really outstanding and really interested. And we invited them to do a, a situation analysis, gave a lot of information from the conference, background, surveys we took, we do a lot of PMRs there, uh, finding out what people are thinking. And we sent them all this data with the situation analysis. And 23 of them completed it. And if you complete it, you get to go to the conference to, or the meeting to put this together to build a plan. 18 were able to come. Some people still stay connected, but they weren't part of the 18. But they did contribute. Uh, and that group then, in three hours, three hours, developed a five-year plan. And three years out of that plan was, how are we going to organize this? Nonprofit, no 501c3, all-volunteer operation. And we went from Newtonian type kind of organizations that you understand, you know, I tell you what to do, you tell me what to do. Yeah, I listen to my peers, good people talk to each other, but it's hierarchical. To quantum. And quantum is everything interacts with everything else. And you've got to measure the results. Now, we started that um, last spring at the conference. It was the first meeting. And there's three, two presidents and one vice provost of University of Wisconsin Madison, which has 30 colleges. And those three all practice servant leadership. And wherever they are responsible for the institution, that institution practices servant leadership. And they'll each take a two-year stint. We have one part-time paid person looking for a second that will facilitate the building of these roundtables. And we have people waiting in line for, I want a roundtable, I want a roundtable, in very unique areas like law enforcement, city and towns in the state of Wisconsin. Um, very, very interesting journey. And this, the idea of this is this organization has to live beyond Tom Thibodeau and I. Tom doesn't want to change anything. He's only 72. But 17 months or 19 months, I'll be 90. And I need to get on with this thing, you know. I don't want to leave a hole behind. So that's what we're doing. Uh, the concept. Uh, of global universal view from the beginning. From the beginning. Using the Old Testament teachings, the example of Jesus, that came much later. And people said, well, that's, that's religious. I said, no, it's not religious. It's something that the world understands. And, and that came about because we came up with a mission statement and everybody in the room said, we want you to describe the, the, what, the, what we have going here. And the least likely guy in the room insisted on it. He was not a faith-based. I don't believe in religion, blah, blah, blah. Well, this is not religion. The example of Jesus and the teachings of the Old Testament. Proverbs is a big source. Um, and so that's uh, what we used in the company. And that's the way in which I conducted my life, and many other people do as well, but in all different forms. You know the people whose heart and heads are connected. They know you. Uh, I already talked about homostatic control. Along the way, in my late fi early 50s, I came up with everything we had 
And then I sent it out to all the smartest guys in the country. I said, what do you think? And they sent me stuff back. And then I took all that and put it together. And Norm Dahl and Ronnie Henson and I met with Peter Drucker at his house. And he said, well, send me everything. You want this? You want that? Yeah, send me that, send me that, send me this. He said, I have never received so much stuff from one company because we had everything documented, everything flowed. All of that is in the archives at SRPFF for any researcher to go look at. And it's intended for research. Uh, there's also uh, post meeting, not post meeting reactions, uh, video interviews of people who, are, who have left the company or have retired and their view of the evolution of the company because it's in a learning curve, continuous. And you know that what the company is doing or what your boss is doing is not a subject in this room. It's your learning that's going on today. Um, the corporate ID was valued equal to the net worth of the company. Uh, we found it out, by, I ran a class, several of them, and I said, what do you think this, the corporate ID is worth? You're gonna sell it to somebody else, and that is done. And the value that they ended up coming with, now that they would buy it for a lot less, of course, but selling it, now wait a second, now what do you mean? Really, all that? Oh, they put a value on it, and it was a big spread. So we just average it up and say, that's the value. And the value equaled to the net worth of the company, and the net worth is what you would call, in your statements, equity. How many of you are stockholders? So you got probably 40% here. Um, so what, what they call equity is equal to the corporate ID. Um, and we have a video on, uh, to show where that came from. Three drivers are employees, customer satisfaction, and safety. You do that well, and they're interconnected. Um, and that's a subject unto itself. If you care about people's safety, they're going to be ha more happy. If the customers see you with a safe work environment, they're going to respect you more and want to do business with you. And then you can reverse all that. If you've got happy employees, I was just at somebody's house. I walk in the front door, and this is not a buddy of mine, but he's a fellow president, mature guy. He says, ah, oh, people are electric. He says, we've spent more money with your company. And he has a house that looks like an industrial facility. I mean, he's got two PCs and different, controlling all his systems and water and filtration. Oh my goodness, he's having a great time. He must be an engineer. <laughs> um, so customer relations, extensive. Customer employee communication, exceptional. Synergy, value added. Partners, we have contracts that are unbelievable they call partnerships. There are no bids. There's accountability. Uh, every aspect of the company had accountability, qualitative and quantitative. Every aspect. Solid, reliable information, transparency. Trust always is on the high ground. Foresight was not in my vocabulary but it's one of the traits of servant leadership. And so I, I wanted to understand that more. I don't know how to look for foresight in p other people. So I went to a seminar with then CEO of the company, and in the first two hours I found out how it works. This fellow had developed a master's program in foresight, and he said 10% of the people naturally have foresight. That's a small, small minority. Uh, 20%, there's no way to 30% that they will ever learn it. 60% uh, can learn it in this program, which was a week long. Very complicated, but people could learn. That's just the way it is. There was another program in university, that, that was Houston in California that teaches foresight also. The big thing is this, the light distinguishes the darkness. If you are on the high ground and somebody is an ass or behaving another way, it doesn't always catch immediately, but eventually it does. Every person in this 
business for the last 60 years, with the exception of one, uh, that's not legitimate or ethical, goes out of business within 20 years. They're gone. And they leave not on a very nice note. So staying on the high ground in perpetuity, this is an in perpetuity program. It's yours, you decide, your feedback, your questions. How, how many people here have filled out an employee survey in the last year? Now that's what that's for. Tell them what you think. Tell them what you think. Do it in a way that is constructive, not you ought to do this, you ought to do that, or I don't like this, or this guy here is a jerk, and that department doesn't know what they're doing, or those guys are fabricating information. You tell them the questions that they should process. I would look into this area uh, to see what the trust level is. That's a question, open question, okay? Staying on the high ground over the long run is rich and rewarding. I've never been economically motivated. I made tens of millions of dollars, uh, stock market, uh, real estate. Uh, I just was a good steward with what I was given. Time, possessions, um, resources, and we're giving it all back to the community. And 90% has already been done. The biggest portion, by far, was the value of the company. It's yours.